Hey, well, welcome, Corne Kriga, to the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show. You're, you're an ex Springbok rugby captain, and yeah, man, I just kind of like, I can't even believe I'm even chatting to you. So it's an honor for to have you as a guest. Thanks very much, Kurt. Yeah, same same for me. Um, I feel honored to to be on your podcast. <laughs> well, that that means so much to me. So, um, before we kind of like really dive in, um, you know, it, it's so crazy because I was thinking the other day uh, when I when I told my wife, I was like, oh yes, yeah, I'm I'm going to be speaking with uh, Corne Kricher, and she was like, wow, yeah, have we seen him play? I'm like, yeah, no, I'm sure we saw him play like in 2015 in in the UK, and then. <laughs> yeah. I went back and I looked at your career when you when you actually retired and I was like, whoa, that was 20 years ago. Um yeah. I was wondering if it almost feels like a bit of a past life now. It does. Eh? It it really is in a way like in the first few years I didn't even watch rugby. You know, I was like I was feeling like a bit unsettled and getting used to work life. And then I started getting back into rugby, and like you said, now you know exactly. It feels like years and years ago. Um, but every time I go to a rugby match, I was at the Australia South Africa game two weeks ago, and you know the tears run down my face because I, I just I still so passionate about it. I still love the the way um, the Springboks play. I still love watching the national anthem. I still love watching. The people are crazy. The people go when when we score a try. So, yeah, like you said, a bit of a past life, but but very much part of my life. Oh wow! But yeah, I mean, even just listening to that kind of gives me goosebumps. I can imagine it just must bring a lot of kind of emotion back, you know. And you you kind of like know what the Oaks are feeling, and yeah, just yeah. just being a spectator must be a, a very different experience. I can imagine. Hundred percent. You know, I, I, you always think the the. In the first ten years, I think after you retire, you still think you can play. So then you 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 you're thinking, oh, I wish I could be on the field now. But like nearly twenty years later, um, I know now I can't play, and you know they'll definitely annihilate me on the field. So so it's now the one where I'm I'm really happy that I'm not on the field, but I'm glad I'm at the game. <laughs> I always like I always like watch sports. Um, it was particular well, when I watch rugby. I don't know what it's like for you, but like I'll be <clears throat> on on the couch, like watching the game, and then what? Like my, I'm like I'm moving my body the whole game as if I'm like almost playing. <laughs> I don't know if you kind of like do the same thing when you when you watch a game yeah, these days. I, I, I'm I'm bad to watch a game with because I, I'm I'm jumping up and down and I'm walking around when I'm nervous. My hands and feet are sweating, but you know, it, like I said, it's so much part of uh, so big part of your life for so long you can't just forget about it and leave it there and then it's done uh, it's it's always going to be part of us <laughs> yeah i can imagine but um so in south africa like well first of all like i love hearing about uh, mentors that have sort of helped people in their life grow and, and get to where they are and almost like give them opportunities uh, in South Africa, there's an amazing rugby comp competition uh, called Craven Week, which is effectively like the youngsters yeah. from all the provinces that are that are that play. And I remember as a lighty, like it was always televised from from memory, and and it was in like winter, yeah. and I would like love watching it, you know. And you mentioned that one of your sort of mentors was actually a, a coach that uh, that was a Craven Week coach. I think he either gave you an opportunity to play there. Or um, he was actually your coach in Craven Week. Do you can you just tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, he was the Craven Week coach, um, and you know one of those coaches who had had the let's call it the emotional intelligence to see that there was some talent, but very rough and very naughty, you know. And and a normal most of those coaches were just teachers at a school, so you you expect that um, the guy would be a normal teacher and he'd rather avoid the naughty kid and just pick somebody else or, you know, just go the easy route without, you know, administering or managing a, a, a kid who's unplayable, you know. And I'm forever grateful for for that coach who, who above, you know, against the odds, decided to pick me for, for the Craven Week team and then made me captain, 
you know, and gave me that responsibility. And he had the vision to see that, look, this kid's naughty. But hell, if I give him some responsibility, maybe he'll step in line, you know. And after making me the under-13 captain for Western Province, I, I kept basically captained, captained every single team I played after that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for him. It's amazing how, like, one decision can kind of, like, change the trajectory of our life. And, you yeah, know, he, sure. he, he literally, he, I guess you have a lot to, th- to be thankful for that guy. Do you, do you ever sort of say, like, keep in touch with him if he's still around? No, I, I don't even know where he is. I don't even know. I've never made contact with him again, you know. But, but yeah, as I said, I'm, I'll, be, I'll forever be grateful that, that he, he took the chance, you know, to, to try and manage me, which was, which was, <laughs> which was not an easy thing. So, so, like, why were you such, like, a naughty guy? Were you, like, rebelling for some reason or just, yeah, just a normal th- kid? You know, yeah, you know, I think I, um, I I came from Zambia. My parents were three and a half thousand kilometers away. Um, I went to school at the age of four. Um, I turned five in, in grade one on the 21st of March. So I was very young. So I was a year young. I'd already started a year back. So I was only a year. I was 12 when I played on the 13th grade one. But I, I was, I was definitely, I would have been diagnosed ADHD today. In those days, you were just a naughty, busy kid, you know. Um, so no doubt, I would have, I would have been on the on the tablet to calm me down, and keep me still in class so that I could actually listen for more than ten minutes. But I, so I was busy and naughty, but not bad naughty. But I was just, I was just a normal boy. You know, a, a twelve-year-old boy who had lots of energy, and so at least this guy could manage that that energy and, and channel it in the right direction, which I'm, which I, I really am forever grateful. Yeah, I think that's such an important thing, you know, like um, to find that that you know, if you find that little kind of like uh, gem, like you were, and then to channel the energy correctly, like it's can make just the world a yeah. difference. Um, it, it's funny you also mentioned there was a there was a school teacher of yours who who was also like a mentor and i think in south africa to me that seems like like it's quite a almost a common thing like i have the same uh sort of experience one of my teachers in school um you know like who's effectively like one of my best friends you know or my best friend like yeah. he uh he also mentored me and uh, i think we i don't know it feels like I don't know, it just feels like in South Africa, we're quite lucky with, with the teachers that we have and that they kind of help us through certain yeah. parts of our life. There, there's no doubt that that male teachers are, are massively important for boys um, because they understand what a boy thinks like, what, what boys want to do, what they, how, they, how they react when you punish them. So, that, so it's massively important for me that um, male teachers, teachers um, I really do believe that it is a calling it's like nursing you know you, you've been called to be a teacher because you need to be able to work with kids and not everybody has that ability so you know M- Mr. Fisaki who was my my school um, coach and and and, and mentor um, really was 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 just an incredible um, guy who looked after me Punished me when I needed to be punished. In those days, uh, corporal punishment was still there. So you know, you um, you take you take the the good with the bad. You know, but he, but punishing and correcting are two very different things. And and yes, it was punishment because it was at those days corporal punishment was still at, at the order of the day. But his his was always a correction. This was always a word to say, Kuna, you can't go down this route. You know, for, for you to be able to be successful in life one day, you know, you're going to have to be more disciplined. You're going to have to do it this way. And then obviously the punishment came with it, but it was a correction and not a punishment always, you know. So, yeah, very grateful for him and, and many other um, teachers who came along my way. Yeah, for sure. So you talk about you talk about success, but you also say that with uh, with privilege, uh, with massive privilege comes massive responsibility, and yeah. um, obviously you've uh, you've captained the Springboks. And I was just thinking, I was like, in South Africa, there's kind of like a hierarchy. Um, it's probably like Springbok rugby captain, 
president um so so you kind of yeah. have had the highest privilege ever like what i mean what does it feel like sort of being captain and, and stepping out there with the you know knowing what south africans are like uh, when it comes to rugby yeah south africans always want us to win um, so no matter where you play, how you play, you, all you need to do is you need to win. And and it's very hard for coaches and for players because you have to live up to that expectation. And I read, I once read a thing about Herschel Gibbs and Herschel Gibbs said the following. He said, I've received a talent to play cricket. I haven't necessarily received a talent to be an example or or a, a to the to the younger younger kids, and I thought about it and it, and it's hundred percent true. Not everybody is designed to be an example, but I still feel that with a, um, and I'm I'm mates with with um, Rachel and he's a great guy and I love him to bits. I, I think the 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 key is like us like you said earlier is with great um, honor comes responsibility and and privilege. So when you have that privilege, you've got to, there is some responsibilities on you to be an example, to be kind, to be to be open hearted, to 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 show that you just human. You can also make mistakes, um, and and I'll never forget. I was I just I think in one of my first test matches, we had a signing session, and people were queuing to to with their kids to sign balls and jerseys and the whole lot. And um, this lady came past and she said, you know, she said in Afrikaans, she said, you know, Kona, promise me that you'll never do what Hansi did to my, to my, to my child. And, and, and I thought it a very cruel, a very cruel comment because Everybody's situation is different, and there was a there was like a massive judgment towards him about what he'd done with with um, in 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 India, and Hansi had already passed away. Hansi Kronia, I'm talking about. Yeah. And um, and I thought about that very carefully, and I thought, you know, in a way, she had the right to say that, but it's still hard, and it shows you how hard the public are on on on. Our, on, on the sportsmen or the because to be honest sportsmen are celebrities in our country you know so um we don't, we don't really have the movie stars roaming around so if you're great in cricket and rugby and whatever you, you you're pretty much royalty in south africa so i felt that it was a harsh a very harsh comment to make but it hit deep down inside me that you know there is some responsibility on me to to be you know, an example because there's so many people in in South Africa that don't have hope, and that don't that wake up every morning and don't have hope, and and it's our responsibility to give them hope. You know, and I want to give a very small example. My my son is a bodybuilder, and two in Melpo Strand, where I live, two world champions have come from from where we live. So my son, who is really good at bodybuilding, truly believes that he can be a world champion one day. As a result of those two people that set the example. And that's why it's so great that, that we have people that we can look up to and that we can we can strive to be like, not only on the field, not only in the sea, but in life, you know. And that's that's for me is key. That's key. Well sure, man. Yeah, I mean I can I can kind of almost relate to that story with, with your son, you know, like as I guess, you know, my experience to life is obviously very different to your experience. Um, I, like, I feel like I'm kind of this normal civilian and you, like you said, you kind of this <laughs> rock star guy because of, um, you know, the, the life that you've had by, by playing rugby. Um, did you ever have anybody that uh, you kind of really looked up to when you were lighty, like that you were like, I want to be like that guy one day? Yeah, it's actually very weird because I'm, I'm I'm good friends with him now. Um, Tian Strauss was a number eight for South Africa, not in the World Cup in '95, but what a guy that I looked up to, what 
one because at the time he wasn't the biggest guy around. He, he's very strong and stocky. But, you know, I looked up to him and sadly, by the time I got to 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 playing professional rugby in 1996, he left in 1995 just after the World Cup because he didn't make that World Cup team. So he went to Australia and went, and went to play in Australia. And then I played against him um, in Super Rugby. And Again, you know, an example of a guy who's humble, who lives by the right rules and let's not call it rules, let's by the ethics and, and, and his morals and ethics are are pretty much the same and, and such a nice guy to to be with and an example to the younger kids, you know. So it's great to be mates with him now and cycle with him. We we do a lot of mountain biking together. So I actually did the Absa Cape Epic with him. He was my team partner, and um, hard as hard as nails, but but just a great guy. And 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 that's what South Africa needs. We need role models, and we need examples out there for the kids. It feels like the world needs examples at the moment. Uh, there, I don't know. I don't know what you think, but it seems like there there seems to be a bit of lack of like strong kind of men leadership. You know, if you look at the say you know guys just in in government for example and and i know that's not necessarily a great example but yeah. doesn't really feel like there's a, there's strong leadership there D- do you think about yeah. that much at all like um and yeah yeah i do i do I, I think about leadership all the time and and i think about a lot of people don't see themselves as leaders but those people are are also fathers and if you're a father, if you're the man in the house, you're a leader. You're leading a family. You, your your family is a team. And I had a, a, the privilege of of speaking at a school quite recently of a Father's Day, and and about um, being a being a mentor for your children, being an example for your children. And that's probably the most difficult thing to do, because um, nobody teaches you how to how to be a father. There are no rules and regulations around fatherhood there are no there's no guidelines you know and every child is different every child needs to be handled differently so it's an incredibly difficult thing to do but yet we we still need to set the example we need to be because what you want you obviously you want your kids to be successful and 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 be happy in life you know because life's short there's there's so many things that happen and and life can run past you so quickly that you know when you're working at your hardest building a business or um work working your way up in a big company you have to spend a lot of time at work that's also the time that you're building a family you know so how do you get that balance and 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 how do you make sure that you're still fit and healthy and and that you can play with your kids and that you can do stuff with your kids and and be a mentor for them and, and be there, you know, for them when, when they're going through, through tough times. So we're all, we're all in the same little boat and it's a very rocky boat and there's rough seas out there. But yeah, I agree with you. There, there's, there's not enough big, strong men coming forward saying, you know, this is, this is what we, this is how we should be. This, this is how, Men should act. This is how you should be a father. This is how you should be a, a husband to your wife. And and you know, in South Africa, we have some atrocious um, um, examples, sadly. Um, just talking about fathership a little bit. Uh, what what sort of maybe what 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 advice have you got? Like then, um, that as as you're a, I mean, a, a very experienced leader. And um, I'm, you obviously have three kids and stuff. And like, what, what what advice have you got for fathers to lead their family well? Sure, Gareth. Um, that's probably the toughest question you're going to ask today. I my my feeling is that you know you've got to live the life that you want your kids to live. Because the kids will do what you do. They don't. They won't do what you say. And and just by saying that, that's the toughest thing to do is to always be the example. And yes, we all make mistakes. You know, we all 
we all do wrong things. We we all get angry when a taxi turns in front of you and, and nearly causes an accident and then you want to swear at the guy and pull him off the road and beat him up. But what example do you, are you setting to your kids? Because you, your kids are sitting in the car looking at you going, geez, never seen my dad that angry. You know? um, so there's there's lots of there's lots of advice I could give, but everybody has has got their own way. And, and I said there's no one way that's successful. But the one thing I can say is that, um, you know, having having a, a spiritual side to your to your approach, and having the kids believe that, you know, there is a there is a higher being, and that they they can always fall back to, back back to you know that's that's the one thing I I really encourage and then the other thing is to you know is to really be the example not not just talk because kids kids look at you they're not stupid from a very young age they look at you and they go no what he's saying and what he's doing is two different things you know so I think that's probably the most difficult thing for them for them yeah yeah for sure I like that a lot. I just want to, like, when you say spiritual, like, what does spiritual mean for you? Because I think for, like, different people, it means different things. But, yeah. and, and I do agree, like, I think it's important to know that, like, we're probably part of something bigger. Yeah. I, you know, I, I was born and raised in a Christian um, home where we went to church every Sunday at, at, at my old school, Paul Boys High. I had to go to church twice on a Sunday. So, the Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. Um, and I think that set the right tone because, you know, even though I've, I've gone off the path many times and come back onto the path, I think having something to stand for, if you stand for nothing, you fall for anything, you know, and I think that's one of the key principles is that you've got to stand for something and you've got to have some moral guideline, you know, and, so, you know, that's how I raised my my family and my and my kids, and and luckily my wife was of the same same belief, and and I said I, I said to my kids, you know, it's, even though marriage is isn't always easy, and I love your mother to bits, and one of the biggest um, uh, can I say gifts that you can give your children is to is to have a loving marriage which which is an example to them because one day they're going to get married and they can they can probably going to do pretty much what we do the example that has, was has been set to them they're probably going to follow so yeah i think that's one of the greatest gifts you can give them is just have a loving marriage where where there's tolerance and where when people make mistakes there's forgiveness and that it's a that it's a you know a loving environment for them to grow up in. Yeah, I totally agree. Like everything that you're saying, I guess, is is like literally lead by action and lead by example and like almost be the change you want to see, you know, like just uh, I yeah. think those are, those are really important traits for all of us to kind of remember. Um, just talking a little bit about privilege, uh, you, you've had the honor of, of having lunch with uh, Nelson Mandela and that yesterday was uh, Nelson Mandela Day. Like, I, I know you've written about it. Uh, can you just maybe speak a bit about that experience? Yeah, look, I I played rugby in a very difficult era. Um, I played in my in my first my first um, outside of school. Yeah, I I played my first let's call it mini test match at, at under 20 rugby or under nine. It was under 20 at the time. Um, and we had, we, we, we went to a world cup. I was, I was the captain of that team. We went to a world cup in France in 1994. And um, we didn't have a national anthem because, you know, um, the STEM was banned and of course the wasn't there, you know, and, Nelson Mandela played a big role in keeping the Springbok emblem, not making it a protest. All the other sporting codes are, are protests, where the Springboks are the Springboks, you know. And to have, 
to then in later years in 1994 Nelson Mandela was released and and to then in 2009 be able you know be able to take my family my kids are very young that's the photo right up there you can see it there um that you know to take my family there spend some time with them and have the opportunity to just experience what an incredible person he was you know um now that's a real privilege you know i really even though it was a very difficult era and 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 we didn't the Springboks didn't do as well as we should have done at the time or as much as the the public expected us to do um the one of the advantages was that he was still alive and he was still there and and i would get a phone call from him you know before a test match to say good luck for the test match and they are just a just a massive honor for me to to be able to be in that position at that time my i wrote a book called uh, the right the the right place at the wrong time but if that was one reason to be the right place at the right time, then, you know, then then that was it. Yeah, but uh, I mean, he's he's just such an an amazing character. I can imagine that the presence that he holds is pretty great. Uh, I remember, I, I actually, I've I've lived overseas for a long time since I was nineteen, and I lived in the UK. But I went home, or I was actually home at the time that he died, um, and I was lucky enough to actually be in Joburg then. Uh, maybe lucky is not the right word, but I was, you know, I was there and um, we went to where his house was and, uh, you know, like it was just amazing. Like there was just this street full of like flowers, you know, and yeah. just full of people. And it was like a really kind of like beautiful, humbling experience, yeah. just going, you know, like almost saying thank you. And then the other the other amazing thing, like in the African tradition, like rain means quite a lot, right? And I think they say like when it rains, that's that you almost like, it's almost the heavens accepting you in. And yeah. I don't know if you remember, but the day that of his funeral, it was like the biggest downpour we'd had like yeah. in ages. Yeah. And it was, I was like, yeah. wow, the the world is, is speaking to us there. Hey? <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, you know, you, you meet certain people who think they're important and they, they make you slightly uncomfortable because they really are very important people. Whereas the day I, I met Nelson Mandela, he, he, he shook my hand. That, that specific day we had lunch with him, he, he shook my hand and he said, why would a um, strapping young man like you come and visit an insignificant man like me. And I knew immediately what he was saying, because he could obviously see that I was quite nervous. He wanted to try and he wanted me to relax and, and to feel that I'm that it's, it's not this massive disparity between the two of us, you know. But just an incredible, humble guy, and like you said, you know, a, an incredible privilege. Yeah, it's amazing. Like you read stories about him, like how he just like made people feel comfortable. You know, he would go into hotels and he would be, you know, be greeting the the guy at the door and the, the receptionist and that. And like he just like really had this kind of way of making you know him feel like one of the people. And and I think that was just yes. such an amazing trait. Um, it's a great trait, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So so like you said, you grew up actually in in Zambia um, from Lusaka. And then um, you yeah. moved to South Africa when you were four years old. And 20 years later, you were captaining the Springboks. Like, that's, that's quite an amazing achievement. Um, I was just wondering, what, like, how vivid are those memories of yours from that, that first day, like, or first game playing for the Springboks? It's, it's probably the day you'll never forget. And um, I, I was quite fortunate in the sense that... Um, Nick Mallet was our coach at the time. And I was a young upcoming player in the team, but hadn't played my first test match yet. So I was, in those days, you, everybody didn't come off the bench. Only when a guy was half dead, you, they took him off and then you had to replace him. Whereas now it's not, it's like, now it's, so, most of the subs come on just to, to get fresh legs on the field because the game is so quick. So I was on the bench a couple, a couple of times, never got on. And then, we played Italy in Durban and Nick Miller, um, Gary Tashman got injured 
And Rusty Rasmus had played a couple of test matches and he was offered the captaincy. And he said, no, he doesn't want the captaincy. And then Nick Mallet came to me and said, you know, Cornet, would you, you've been SA schools captain, you under 20 captain, um, you know, would you, would you consider being the captain? And I didn't even, I said, I didn't even flinch. I said, yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to, love to be the captain. And yeah, that was it. You know, I played, I captained uh, the Springboks in my first test match, which was quite, quite daunting, you know, because you, you need to worry about your game. But, you know, luckily we, we had a very good game and, and we beat Italy 101 0, which was a record score at that time. So it was, it was incredible, an incredible day in Durban, which I'll never forget. How easy is it to like zone out? Uh, you know, I guess from that responsibility and then like, you know, you you got the crowd and you're probably a little bit emotional and now you've got to like focus on your game. How, how easy or difficult is that? It's not, it's not easy. And and that's why I respect captains who, who, who play at a very high level despite all the other responsibilities that come with it. You know, and it's not everybody, that's why not anybody or everybody can be a captain, you know. So, I think um, if I if I look at um, a lot of the the rugby captains that are around, most of them can can keep their their form despite all the other things. Because often you're thinking for other people, you're thinking what the you're thinking what the ref is thinking. You're trying to be ahead of the game. You're trying to call make the calls, and there's so so much going on that if you do play well, like Sia Kalisi has been doing the last. How many years? You know, he's been playing really well in the Springbok jersey. And he's got all that the other responsibilities that he carries with him. Yeah. No, I can imagine it's a, it's not an easy task, that's for sure. Um, I just want to tell a little story, right? Um, I lived in London for for 20 years. And uh, on the 23rd of November, I think it was 2002, uh, my friend Jeremy and I, we I think we were at our like fourth game in a row at Twickenham, like, and we'd been going since 99. And the Springboks were playing uh, England, and we'll talk about the game in a second. But I just want to explain. It's something so the, else I won't forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so at the end of the game, you know, we were like, okay, we were a little bit uh, sort of uh, unhappy, but ugh, I don't know. It, it, we were still at Twickenham, so we didn't really mind, you know. Yeah. Um, but Jeremy and I we were on the the platform at uh, Twickenham uh, train station, and this uh, the trains were all like sort of coming in to to take us back to waterloo and and the platforms are packed right and uh this particular train because there were so many people they had actually it was actually i think like one that they i don't know used for animals or something like that because there was no um there was no seats in it whatsoever uh this this particular whole i think it was the whole train or maybe it was just our carriage and we 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 got Mm -hmm. this one but anyway we got on it and we were like the only two guys in our Springbok jerseys still, I think. <laughs> and the rest of the, yeah. the rest of the carriage was these, um, was the, the poms. Right. And they, they love, they love it. Right. They are like, we've just smashed mm-hmm. you guys. And they started singing to us. Like literally the whole carriage was singing to me and Jeremy and, and they've got this song yeah. they go, I would rather be West Indian than South African. <laughs> and then it just really? carry, it just carries on. But, and they go through like almost every single yeah. country you can think of. And then besides South African, yeah. and we're just sitting there, we're like, yes, you guys are really taking the Mickey now, you know what I mean? Yeah. But um, so yeah. that was just a just a, a funny story. Um, but obviously that, yeah. that game was was a big game. Like South Africa, um, we, we got beaten um 53-3 by England. And and I know you yeah. you you've spoken about it quite a bit. I mean, you don't have to speak about it now if you don't want to, but maybe just just a, a little bit uh to kind of let people know how that was for you. Yeah, you know, there was a tour. It was a tour that um, I shouldn't have been on. I had a, I had a finger operation, and and the coach from Australia said, "Look, we really need your leadership and and a bit of experience because we're taking a very young team, which a lot of coaches do. At the end of the year, they take a young team. It's the end of the season. A lot of guys are injured, and um, yeah. So John Davidez played his first Test match in that on that tour. I think Bucky's and Victor." Played the, you know, two two second or third test, um, very young team coming through the system, but not an experienced team. And and England had a very experienced team. And on the day, 
you know, we got a red card within 10 minutes from Yanis Navaskachni. And um, the rest is history. You know, we got we got annihilated. So I had the I had the I had the privilege of having the biggest win in Springbok history, and I had the privilege of the negative of having the biggest loss in Springbok history, 53-3. Luckily, uh, that, that monkey is off my back. It's been taken. I think Evan's got that monkey. Um, I think the biggest loss now is 57-0 or something against New Zealand, or I don't know, 52-0 or 53-0. Um, but a hard game um, for us because a lot of the younger guys I could see were giving up, you know. And I, I as the leader, I I decided there's no ways I'm giving up. I'm going to give it everything I have. And and obviously with that came a lot of, uh, like you said, abuse from from the English, from the English players and and. So yeah, I took I I I took as as much abuse as I could, but then started handing out uh, physical abuse, which is not which is not something I'm really proud of. But it is like you said, it's about twenty years ago now. So um, yeah, it isn't it isn't it isn't great, and still it still haunts me sometimes that I that I that, that I lost my cool, but. It is what it is, and I, I at that time I, I really hated losing. I still I still don't like losing, put it this way. But I really went overboard, and and I've apologized so many times. But I guess when you're speaking about captain, you, you can never apologize enough. I was listening to you speak. Um, I don't know. I think it was quite an old uh, podcast actually on one of the the British uh, radio uh, stations. Like when you were, yeah. I think just before you had actually started playing there. And um, yeah. it, I think uh, you had said that you had reached out to to Matt Dawson to like apologize, and uh, but you didn't kind of receive anything back. To me, it seems kind of strange that an oak would would hold like a grudge against you like for yeah. for such a long time. Yeah, you know, like, he he gave a lot of uh, verbal abuse in that game, and. You know, and I really tried. I really tried to to eliminate him. Let's call it that way, and knock my own player out. So there's a really nice story about that, which I can tell you if you want. Please. So after the test match, and it's funny now, but it wasn't funny then. So uh, I'm hoping people will see it in in the way that I'm that I'm telling the story. And um, that so after the test match, we in tears. We yeah, I was crying. It wasn't I? I was crying for two reasons. One, because we had a very bad loss, and I was the captain. But two, because my body was so sore because I, I put it through so much physical abuse in that game. And then we went to the to press mass conference, and our our, our media liaison officer didn't go to their press conference, so we didn't know what we were in for. But Clive Woodward said that it, um, in in his interview at the at the match post match conference that it was the most brutal test match he'd ever put, um, seen and that you know that the Springboks are a bunch of thugs and so we walked into this cauldron of of media that that were that they had their knives out you know and so I'll never forget I'm sitting next to Rudolph Charlie and there's there's a, a journalist right in front of us who goes Mr. Strali, um, Clive Woodward says that this is the most brutal test match he's ever played in and that the South Africans are a bunch of thugs. What do you have to say about that? And I'll never forget Rudolph leant over like into like forward and said, well, you know, um, two of my players were concussed. You think we concuss our own players? And immediately I was like sliding, I wanted to slide under the, under the, under the, table because I tried to knock Matt Dawson out but I knocked uh, Andre Pretorius out and Matt was half paced but but I knocked uh, uh, Andre Pretorius was stone cold I knocked him out my own play and I knew it was going to come back to bite me when he, <laughs> when he said that and um, the English never ever forgot that game because they, 
they played those videos over and over. You know, a mate of mine um, lived in London at the time, and he said he phoned me on the Tuesday when they had their like their rugby program, and he said he phoned me on the Wednesday. He said, "Kona, you're my roommate at school, but I I've got to tell you that today." Somebody asked me, do you know that Kornay Kricher guy? And, and I said, no, I've never met him. He denied that he'd met me. I said, hey, thanks, mate. That's a really nice, that's really nice of you to, to deny that you met me. You could have come up for me if you wanted to. But anyway, um, it was it was a bit it was a bit messy at the time. Wow. <laughs> wow. Jesus, um, that's weird that that mate said that, but um, but interesting. <laughs> uh, but 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 like, like you know what? Um, I think South African supporters are, you know, we also super proud of just actually being there, you know, like and and I don't think everyone took it maybe as badly as you know you might you might have felt. So it's just just even as a supporter, you know, like just being at the match to watch it and like you know, I I even remember like it was always. A struggle those those seven in a row that we lost to Twickenham um going to work on the yeah. Monday but but for me I was yeah. always like you know it doesn't matter I'm just I'm just here supporting yeah. supporting my rugby team and 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 that's all that counts it's a privilege to go and watch these guys um yeah. and I think now it's seven in a row for us by the way. yeah no I mean since like but if we're not there it must be close yeah. yeah, we well the thing is like so so the funny thing as well this friend of mine Jeremy and I, I think it was two thousand and six like this was we were, we had been to all the games right in all the yeah. years at at Twickenham, and it was I think this time we were playing England twice and it was like the eighteenth and the twenty fifth of November or something the eighteenth we went yeah. and we lost and I was like I was like, and we had tickets for the next week and I was like. But yeah. let's sell these tickets. I mean, maybe it's us. Maybe we're jinxing the box. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. they've lost every time we've been there. And then, we, yeah. and then I think we we couldn't even get rid of them or something ridiculous like that. I mean, I don't know. My, my memory's pretty yeah. bad. But but we went. But and we won. And I was like, yeah, that's it. That's what we yeah. went. We've never. I don't that's think we've got turn. that. Yeah. Exactly. I don't think we've got that drunk in our lives again. But it was flipping great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, I actually, I had uh, Joe Van Niekirk uh, on the show and Andre F Fenter as well, like super yeah. awesome guys, you know, and, and both, uh, both are yeah. doing sort of great things right now. And, and Joe is like, I mean, he's, a, I don't know if you, if you sort of keep in touch with him and, and see what he's doing, um, yeah, do. but you do. Yeah, that's cool. So anyway, I, I asked them both um, and Joe came back to me with a question that, that's, that sort of uh, popped up and he, he, there was a, there was a thing in South Africa, which, um, was quite a big thing at the time, although I guess the public only found out later. Um, it was a thing called a uh, camp uh, Staldrat. And yeah. when it was explained to me, like um, it almost sounds like it's uh, it's something that David Goggins would have to do in a uh, sort of hell week at SEALs training. And um, yeah. you, so, so Joe was just wondering, like he was like, what was, what was it like? And like, why didn't, sort of more senior players uh, sort of stand up when it was happening. Yeah. Yeah, so Camp Stradot was, was again, a part of a, a era in, in Springbok rugby, which, I see, as I said to you earlier, over and above the fact that I met Nelson Mandela, it was, the, the, the rest was a bit rough. And, and it's one of those things that brought out a lot of emotion in, in, in South Africans. Because, you know, taking a, taking a team to a, a very, very hard military type camp has its merits because, you know, you, you, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about your, your teammates, and you understand that without your teammates, you can't actually get to the other side. So you, you lean on each other because one guy's good in the water and another guy's good on land, you know, and, and you, you, you understand each other's strong points and each, each other's weak points, which is crucial in, in, in sport, let's call it that, not even just rugby. But the only difference in this camp, or the, the, the camp was that it was more of a breaking down than it was of a building up, you know, and, and they had the military, like the special forces military there, who, who were used to being broken down for a year and then built up over three years. 
but we had five days or four days you know so to break us down and build us up in four days three days it's, it's not enough time you know so yeah i think some of just some of the things that happened there you know um again hindsight is an exact science you know and i've I have actually it was the twenty year twenty years since um come and um the Wales team now before the World Cup did a similar camp in, in Wales. The only difference was that it was more positive. It wasn't a breakdown business, it was more a build up, um, you know, like a positive camp. And the thing for me was that I did I did stand up once or twice, or actually once only. I did stand up and say, guys we're not going to take this abuse anymore. We were in a, in really, really cold wind, uh, water in the, in this time of the uh, middle of the winter in, in the high felt. It was freezing. And like, you know, I was literally close to hypothermia. And and a lot of other guys were really struggling. I said, come, let's walk out of the water. Yeah. And we walked out of the water and the guy shouted, you know, who, who said you can come out of the water? But we just kept on walking. And then obviously a couple of gunshots flew our flew over our head into the water, and everybody just turned around and went back in. So it's one thing to say, you know, as a leader, like I really wanted to go to the World Cup because we were told under no circumstances we wouldn't go to the World Cup if we didn't make that camp. But I really wanted to go to the World Cup. But 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 I, the lesson I learned there is that you mustn't want something so bad that you prepared to give up your morals and your ethics and and things that you stand for you know and and you don't i i felt that i i let down a lot of my very close friends um especially like i don't want to say the softer guys because because saying they're soft I, rugby players are hard in general but soft-hearted people you know like selvin boom you was know, he's, he's a very good friend of mine he's like I'll never forget when they broke the egg on his head, you know, the, the disgust in his face. You know, th those are the things that I, that afterwards you you think about, geez, I was an absolute idiot. I should have stood up more, you know, but I didn't. So lessons, you know, lessons in life and lessons in leadership. And yeah, um, it's uh, one of the things I really regret. I think, yeah, I mean, you, you can kind of understand the, the reasoning of doing it but like you said you know if it's just a breaking down thing and it's such a short time um yeah it's uh it's, it's you're not going to get the kind of desired effect and and also like yeah. you know for you as as like say the, the captain i can imagine like you know in the moments it's very difficult it's very different you know and very difficult yeah. like to to make kind of like certain decisions based on kind of what's on the line so like you said like looking back it's easy to go, yeah, no, maybe I should have done this and should have done this. But like mm. back then you're also a different person, you know, and you were leading these guys and you're like, oh, well, I've got a responsibility to almost maybe be the tough one, you know, and, and show these guys yeah. and stuff. So, yeah. My mindset was more, how am I going to get these guys through this? It wasn't, I'm going to try and bail them out of it, if you understand what I'm saying. So, yeah, but you know, not one of my proudest moments. And and again, you know, you you admit you you take the you take the responsibility and then you move on. You know? So there's a there's a great saying that um, great leaders take a lot less of the of the accolades when things go well and they take a lot more of the of the shots when it's not going well. You know? And I'd like to see myself in, in that in that context yeah. yeah no for sure for sure no definitely i mean yeah there's a great guy uh, gary vaynerchuk and he always he says exactly what you're saying you know if you're a leader of a of a company then you the everything is on your shoulders right you need to take responsibility for especially yeah. the things that go bad um yeah. and make sure when things go right that the right people get the sort of um sort of accolades or the press, uh, yeah. exactly you know what i mean so it's never easy being a leader at the top that's for sure uh no, for yeah yes, for sure. so uh, many professional athletes seem to struggle with the the transition from <laughs> from rugby say or professional sports to becoming literally like a normal civilian and then uh you know having to find a job and and all these sort of things yeah. uh 
how was that experience for yourself? Yeah, by far the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. Um, tougher than come star drafts, tougher, tougher than any Springbok test match against the All Blacks. The, the, again, the big thing is that um, I, even though I was a Springbok captain, you're not guaranteed um, opportunities after rugby. So you're very cautious of, of just retiring and you, you don't have a lot of money. So you, you've got to be wise with your money. And I, I sadly, you know, my first partnership in business didn't go well. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I've walked out of there, you know, let's call it with my underpants on. Um, but if you have that fight in you and if you have the resilience and, and the, I think the confidence and the support to to go forward and, and to keep moving forward and to, to keep trying and to keep working and to keep plugging away at it, you know. Um, and that's pulled me through and obviously with a lot of grace um, and, and some luck, you know, as most um, sports go, there's also, there's, there's skill, there's hard work and then there's a bit of luck, you know. So I've had a bit of all of that, but, but I went through a very, very tough time, probably about five, five to seven years after I stopped playing, I went through a very, very tough time mentally. And um just grateful that I that I had a supportive wife and I had great kids and and something to something to to live for, something to work for, something to, you know, wake up every morning for and 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 you know, still there are times that I that I struggle, you know, even now. But I think the one advantage that that I had, or two two advantages. One was obviously, you know, I, I had my faith as a Christian. I, I could stand strong. I could hold on to something. I, I could pray. I could calm myself down by by you know reading the Bible and praying. That's the one thing. And then the other thing is that I never, when I played, I never really attached who I was as a person to the to the to the title that I had. I wasn't Kornay Krieger, the Springbok captain. I was I was the Springbok captain, but but I knew there was a temporary position that I had the privilege to be in. And and I think a lot of guys who struggle afterwards attach who they are to, to that temporary position. Then once that, that temporary position is gone, you know, they don't know who they are and they don't they don't they, don't, they can't make sense of of Euro to zero in in literally months, you know. So, I think that was the one advantage. I kept all my school friends, you know. This year, I've got my, I've got my thirty year reunion, um, um, at Paul Boy's Eye, and and I've still got so many friends from school, from from my time at the Cape Technicon. I've got a lot of friends there, and I stayed in touch with them, and and. I, and I think that was my saving grace when things went tough, you know, that they were all they were all there. I didn't have just have rugby friends. I, you know, people that that walked a, let's call it a ten year journey with me. I had guys who would run a who had run the marathon with me before. So um I think that was the saving grace. Wow, that's really interesting. Um do you think many guys kind of lose touch with uh, sort of the people that they they kind of grew up with and they just get this new kind of band of people because they move into this effectively like higher echelon of community? For sure. There's no doubt. And then again, you know, if you attach who you are as a person to to your title as a Springbok player or a Springbok captain or whatever, you know, times are going to get very tough for you in, in, because you're not going to be the Springbok captain forever. And you're not going to be a Springbok player forever. Yes, you'll be you'll be one of many Springboks, but you can't attach who you are as a person to that temporary position. And luckily, I always I've also got a very um, rounded wife who who never allowed me to become big headed, never allowed me to become that guy, if you can call it that. You know. So, um, yeah, very grateful for that. 
I can imagine it's like, it's actually quite a difficult thing to do. You know, like you, you sort of get put on this platform because of who you are. Um, so yeah. keeping yourself grounded is, is, a is an art, but, and, um, yeah. you know, something I think many guys probably don't get right. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, uh, like I was just thinking, I was just like watching a, a video yesterday with Roger Federer. Like he seems to be a guy that like, you know, he could have kind of like, just, you know, like thought he was sort of uh, the bee's knees, but he, he just seems like a really nice, genuine guy. And he's sort of remained yeah. grounded as well. And humble. You know, just, you know, but, but humble doesn't come easy and humble being humble is, is something that you actually need to work on and be aware of. Because even if you are humble, sometimes people still think you, you're an idiot and you think some, too much of yourself. So, um, yeah, I think, again, my, my, my schooling background where we, where we were taught to be humble, you know, um, my, my family background, my parents, everybody who, who, who played the, a role, you know, helped me stay grounded that I, that I never, Went overboard, you know. But even even though I I, I was humble and I and I, well, I tried to be humble at all times, um, it was still difficult, you know. And and that's why it's so important that rugby in South Africa we need to start we need to start working with the the, the players currently and ex players. To, to to understand to get them through the difficult times because it's, you know the the tragic news of, of Nick Costa the other day um, committing suicide um, that that really forced home to me that there's a lot more people struggling than we maybe we think you know and um, I don't I'm not necessarily saying that it's because of his rugby background but. There, there are a lot of players struggling, and, and it's it's something that we need to address as ex players, but also as as a community of rugby players and 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 administrators. I always think like for for professional sports, and I mean I'm just this like normal civilian, but it, it feels like there there almost needs to be a sort of coach or someone like that that helps you with the transition from going from a professional sportsman to like a almost an, just, you know, normal person um, because the change is so massive and you like, you almost need to go, yeah. you need to have this guy like or girl, like, you know, a year before you kind of retire and going, cool, listen, yeah. this is what it's going to be like. These are things you should start thinking about um, yeah. to just help you through it. Yeah. I think the Sharks are, are, are working really hard on that. Um, they're really getting, um, mentors, uh, they're already getting the, the, the older players um, involved in business. They, they're having them work at certain places where they can figure out what they want to do. So I really, there are certain unions that are very strong in that and that's a great sign because it's if you have a purpose, if you have a strong purpose straight after rugby, you know, um, then then it makes life so much easier. But if you if you get out of rugby, you have no, um, let's call it um, education after school. So you know you're no um, university degree. It's it's very hard for you to start in a job, or it's very hard for you to start your own business. But you know who helps you through those early days so that you don't lose all your money and then you 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 become even more. Um, you know, in, in you get into bigger trouble. So uh, it really is something that 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 needs a lot more focus, and I, and I, and I hope I can play a role in that some, in some way. Yeah, no, I think it's it's definitely needed. And guys like you that have, you know, like like you said, it, it was a, one of the toughest things you've ever done. But ultimately, it seems like you you've kind of thrived, you know, in your in your business. Um, yeah. And uh, you you have a billboard business, if that's if that's right, and. Um, but it also sounds like you you made of like a few mistakes in the beginning by going too big too soon. Yeah, you know, I, I um, yeah, the only way you learn is by actually going, you know. And my my personality is the one of um, go big or go home, and and I and I 
I had I saw this opportunity and I and I went I went too big and it's and it's still biting me today. You know, I'm still paying off debt that I made six years ago, you know. So but you learn and you you're humbled again because you start getting you think you can think you love it. You think this is easy, I've got it. But it's not. So I was humbled properly then. Um as most people have, you know, as most people have been in business, in in work, in everything. I'm I'm no different to anybody else. I'm I'm just another one who who's running that pot. You know, say so they say a, a a clever guy learns from his mistakes, and a, and a, and a wise guy learns from other people's mistakes. And I just wish I was wise, but I was I was a bit clever. Uh, I like I like that saying actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so I guess you know a lot of your life has been almost about like reinventing yourself. Um, you know, with during these sort of transitions. And I was reading, um, you know, in your blog, which is awesome. Thanks for, thanks for writing all those posts. Has really helped me uh, sort of get to know you better and 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 That's you know help with this man. interview. Um, one of the things that you did recently uh, was a course, um, a program mentorship that uh, Richard Mulholland uh, runs yeah. called Story to Stage. Uh, like, yeah. why why did you decide to do that? And can you tell us like a bit more about it? You know, a friend of mine, many years after I stopped playing, he said to me, so when you played rugby, how many times in a week did you practice your skills? So I said, you know, pretty much every day. You know, we pass the ball every day. Every day we train. Let's call it four to five times a week. And his next question was, so what have you done since you stopped playing to to keep your skills out of rugby? And that really hit hit me hard that I, I, I didn't do any extra courses. I didn't do... So since then, I've tried to do something every second year. Um, and I was looking for something, and um, Story to Stage came up, and I've, d- I've done quite a lot of public speaking because of the position that I was in. I never did any training for public speaking when I was Springbok captain. I never had any media training. Every now and then, we'd, you know, they'd say what not to say and what, to say, what we can say and what we couldn't say. But I'd never done a public speaking course. You know, so hooked onto the story to stage with um, Rich Mulholland, as you said, and it really was the best investment in myself that I've ever made. Because once I did the course, I realized how bad I really was in in, my, in public speaking. Because I did I did everything that I wasn't supposed to do, and I still make mistakes, but. It's given me the confidence, the confidence to to have a topic and speak about it comfortably. And and I used that that Twickenham game in two thousand and two exactly, you know, as as the background of of my of my keynote. And um, and they helped me develop it, but I've taken it further, you know. And it was a, geez, I think it was a twelve week uh, course in the end. Where we worked incredibly hard, and 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 I can tell you that it, that it gave me so much confidence now that that I I speak very easily in front of people now because I'm I'm confident about my subject. It's only when you when you're unsure about your subject that you that you that you start worrying a little bit about you know the the people and what you might sound like, and and then you get quite nervous, you know. So. Uh, it was it's it was a great course and it's and uh, and I still enjoy, you know, speaking about my topic and and presenting it to people and I change it up for different companies and I really enjoy it and and in in the end I feel that I'm making a difference which which is which is part of the journey not only being successful but also making a difference. I uh, asked Rich for for a couple of questions as well. Um... And and one of the ones was like he says in your keynote you go to war with uh, motivation, and the yeah. I think the the topic of your your keynote is debunking motivation. So, yeah, you know, what does debunking motivation actually mean? So so everybody talks about you know we want we need to get a motivational speaker and and 
having a motivational speaker, if you're not motivated inside yourself, will help you for one week and then it's gone. And I talk about uh, being over-motivated, how we, before that England test match, literally were willing to run through a wall, die for our country. You know, and, and one of the quotes I use in my in my keynote is that um, every every um, mount, every guy who went up Mount Everest was every guy who died on Mount Everest was once a highly motivated um, a mountaineer. You know, and 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 sometimes you just need to calm down. And after Janus Lapiskakhi was so motivated, he he made a mistake. It, it was no, there was no. I mean, if you, you can look at it a hundred times, not a red card at all. It's a yellow card. But we got a red card, and and that changed the game. That changed Janus Janus Lapiskakhi's life. He's a pastor now up in 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 Joburg, and doing very well for himself. That also changed his life, you know. So things happen in life, and you and you adapt to that, and you use that to strengthen you and make you better. But, um, yeah, I'm, for me, you know, I, I just I just try and be the best that I can be whenever I can be. But this, this course gave me this opportunity to talk about the, the over-motivation, but also about mistakes about not being too hard on yourself as a leader, you know, um, setting the example, and I, and I work through the whole process of of singing the national anthem, you know, and facing the haka. People people often ask me. They said, "Kono, how did you motivate your players?" And and I go, "Hello, you give a twenty year old kid a, a Springbok jersey, you make him sing the national anthem in front of sixty thousand people." He then walks across and faces the haka where they're showing that they're going to kill him. And you ask me how I motivated my players. I had to calm them down. And it really is like that. Because because the hype, the the tension, the, the adrenaline is pumping. You know, you have to we have to have you have to have a we always spoke about ice in ice fire in the heart and ice in the mind. You know, that, that you've got to get a cool head, but you got to you gotta, inside your heart it's gotta burn. And and I often got that wrong. I often got fire in the fire in the head and ice in the heart. But um, yeah, that's what I talk about. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I, I really enjoy. It. I can imagine, like, <laughs> I can only imagine what it's like when you when you have to sing yeah. that national anthem and then when you 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 face uh, the haka. I actually used to play rugby in the UK um, with a bunch of Kiwis and. Uh, it was crazy, but I mean, the ho- I was literally myself and that guy Jeremy I spoke about before. We were the only South African guys in in the team, and yeah. they played rugby a different way. Like just from what I had Definitely. experienced, say at high school, like yeah. they, they were. It, I don't know. It was just different, but they were. It just seemed to be. I don't know. Harder, a bit more agile. Yeah, I played. I played yeah. in, in. I played. Also played in England. Trust me, it's it's harder because it's it's more. Um, it's not it's not as fast. Because of the weather and the, and the, the conditions of the pitch, mostly it's raining, it's cold, and and the forwards are just grinding it around the sides. You know, it's a, it's a very different game. But I enjoyed my time there. Was actually, I've actually got a nice story for you. So, two thousand two was that fateful day at Twickenham, which you which you went to watch. I'm sorry, by the way. Uh, and then in two thousand and Three after the World Cup, I retired, and I decided I'm going to go and play overseas for a while. And uh, I decided I had the opportunity to go to France, and um, it's one of one of the things I do regret is not going to France. But life, as I said, takes you on a journey, and and we were we just I decided for my for my wife, and that it would be easier if we went to England because we had a coach, Alan Solomon, who was there. We had Selwyn Boom, who's my best mate, who bought a house right next to me there. So, uh, 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 you know, so we was we were living next to each other. Um, Jan van Weyck was there. Robbie Kempson was there. There were a couple of South Africans, so it, it, it made life easier. You could there was immediately friends, 
Um, but when I went to Northampton in the first two weeks, I was alone. My wife was still packing up the house and, you know, bringing some stuff across. And um, the local newspaper wrote, they were very, the people at Northampton were very upset that because I, obviously in 2002, I wasn't the greatest example um, um, at Twickenham. So they were all still angry with me. So the, the, the Northampton Saints is a, probably one of the most, the best supported clubs in in uh, in England. And um, they, the, the, they are incredibly loyal, you know, um, and they were very angry that Northampton Saints had, had contracted me. And the uh, the local newspaper wrote the following: "It said, if they if if Northampton Saints can contract Corne Kricher on the flank, they might as well contract Osama bin Laden and Freddy Krueger with him in the Lustria." And they wrote that in the local newspaper. And somebody somebody bought me the paper. Said, "You got to read this." And I and I cut that I cut that piece out and I kept it um, in my in my in my in my book, that my little black book. And I said, by the time I, I leave Northampton, I want these people to really like me and not not just you know, not 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 have these feelings about me. And in the end, you know, yeah, they were very happy with me. Yeah. No, that's, that's such a cool story, <laughs> but <laughs> classic that they yes, yes, they could have yes, those yeah. are pretty bad um so, <laughs> people. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've been been likened to Osama bin Laden and Freddy Krueger, which is quite neat. Yeah, I'm sure you've <laughs> redeemed yourself with those guys. <laughs> um, I actually think I might have watched you play. Um, I, I went I went to Newcastle. I can't remember the year now, but um, I think it was Northampton playing. Was it, who was Newcastle? The Falcons or something like that? Yeah, the Falcons, um, yeah. yeah, I think I might have watched. Uh, yeah. I, possibly I, I can't uh, remember exactly but um but yeah but so so just to kind of like start finishing things off quickly a, a question i like to ask everybody is what are two books that kind of like maybe changed your sort of perception a little bit on life or or that you found like super helpful for yourself sure. i like I, I really like robin sharma's books um um, and and Malcolm Gladwell, so so yeah. I think number one probably is um, the monk who sold his Ferrari. That really had a had a massive impact on 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 how I thought about things. I use in um, in my talk. I also use. Uh, I don't know if you read that book, but he, but he talks about a lighthouse. All of us, every, every single one of us have a lighthouse. A lighthouse is our ultimate dream. And and sometimes when you when you keep looking at the lighthouse, the light's shining your way. And sometimes when you keep looking at the white lighthouse, the light's shining the other way. So it's dark. You can't see. And one of the things he says in there is uh, when the light shines your way, Never forget, never forget to pick up the diamonds. And what he's actually referring to is that you know you must celebrate the small the small victories that you have in life. You know, and so I think probably number one for me was was the monk who sold his Ferrari, and um, the other one was um, David and Goliath, which which I really like the, the idea of comparing. The David and Goliath in the Bible to, to, to our lives, you know, and often in my business I'm up against Goliath in some of the businesses, you know. So I always I always refer back to the book on, you know, not being not being scared of the Goliaths, but just doing my own thing. Those are two great recommendations, but I remember reading uh, the the monk who sold this Ferrari. I think it was like 2015, and I was like, "Wow!" It really spoke to me at that time because I was actually yeah. going through this transition of leaving my corporate job into going yeah. going at it for myself, you know. And um, it was it was really a great book, and it's quite funny actually. I think I think he's written probably like one of my favorite books and probably one of the worst books ever. <laughs> um, his his latest one, the Five AM Club. I was like. Yeah. I was like, "What is this about?" <laughs> I don't know. I don't I, know if you. I, I'm I'm part of the Five AM Club, 
but I, I think I've got I've got halfway through that. But I honestly, I, I, I yeah, that's how bad it was. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I think he could have written yeah, it in I, ten pages. <laughs> I can re- I can relate to a lot of the things he says in there. Um, I do get up most mornings at five, and that's when I stopped playing rugby. I took a month off, and I said, I've started a family. My my daughter's a couple of months old. What is the time in the day where I can train, where it's not going to affect anybody? It's not going to affect my family. And it's not going to affect my work. And it was 5 a.m. So I got up at 5, left for my home at quarter past 5, got to the gym at 5.30, then trained from 5.30 to 6.30, got back home, quarter to, yeah, quarter to 7, and then made coffee for my family. And that's how, that's how I rolled since then. So, yeah, I still do that three to four days a week. Yeah, yeah, I know. Definitely, the, the message was was good but he could have written it in 10 pages um (laughs) and the story was weird but anyway um i'm glad that he he wrote obviously the monk who who sold the ferrari Uh, yeah no it's a great so uh what are what are are you most excited about um in the future i don't know it could be for yourself or or business and uh, where can people get in touch with you or follow you yeah the thing i'm really excited about is um you know my kids for now, um, I've got some nice things on the go in business, but sometimes your kids really get you excited. My daughter's my daughter's in the trick now. She's uh, going to Stellenbosch next year. She's going to study industrial psychology. Seeing her grow up as a from a girl to becoming a woman um, with great values and just a lovely, you know, warm, loving kid. Um, that really gives me a lot of pleasure. So I'm excited to see her go to Stellenbosch and, you know, have the student life that we all had. Obviously that comes with a comes with a bit of worries, but but that's really that really does excite me. Um yeah, and then in business, you know, business is tough because the economy is, is constrained. It's it's hard. But again, you know, so much to be grateful for and, and Counting, counting your blessings and, and being grateful for what you have and not for what you want. And, um, yeah, that's things I'm excited about. And then what was your second question? Uh, if people want to follow you, uh, could you have a oh, website yes. or wait yeah. online? Yeah, if they, if, they, if, they want to, if they want to follow me, um, uh, at Corner Cricket 6 on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. You try just type in Corner Cricket, you'll find me. And then I'm on LinkedIn. And if you want to email me, it's corne at cornekricher.com. So very easy, corne at cornekricher.com. And you can email me directly. And I'm, I'm always available um, to have a chat and to discuss things. And, and if I can help, you know, you know, I think at, at the stage of, of my life where I am now moving from success to significance makes makes me excited you know that i can be significant that i can make a, a small difference in somebody's life that will it'll mean a lot more to me than more success oh i hadn't heard that sort of line before i like it a lot from success to significance it's uh yeah wow it's quite deep man um and okay so the last question is uh what does being ridiculously human mean to you That's a bit, that's a. I thought about it because I I really liked the um, when you sent me the link to to this thing with being ridiculously human. I really liked the name, and for me, what it what it really means is just being human, because all of us are ridiculously human, but we often act differently because we want people to think different about us. But showing vul- showing vul- vulnerability. Um, all of us are, are in some way vulnerable, vulnerable, and then showing that vulnerability in in areas where you're not strong um, is a sign of, of 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 strength. And even now with my kids, you know, when I do make a mistake, and I humble myself when I say, "Guys, you know what? 
I haven't been a great example to you, and I apologize for that. I'm going to be better. You know, um, that's being ridiculously human. Wow, bud. That's so cool, man. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to say, seriously, thanks so much. I, I've I think I feel like I've had to almost contain myself a little bit uh, speaking to you because I have been super excited. I know as soon as I leave this room, I'm going to go like jump up and tap my feet together um, and just sort of tell my wife all about it. Uh, but yeah. just just chatting to you is... Thanks for having it, me, Gareth. It's I a pleasure, but, but just chatting to you is like so cool, man. Like you you just, you know, even though you've you've had this sort of su- superstar status, seeing you and speaking to you now is just like you 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 this normal human being who is like one of us, you know, who, who's going through the same struggles. Um, but you, you hold a different presence because of, I guess, what you, what you've done and what you've achieved and, and just like sharing your struggles, uh, things that you even regret, but also, you know, just like things that you really love and are joyful for and, and, and just seeing how like important like family and kids are is just, is really amazing, you know? And I think, we, when we're speaking about like leaders and, and the world lacking them, um, I think it really starts with ourselves, you know, and uh, that's how we kind of make an influence on the world. And I think from listening to you speak, that's definitely you. And um, the fact that you're so open to, you know, speaking, you know, just to to me, this almost random guy is just really amazing. And I, and I just wanted to just say thank you, man. It's been a, a real honor and, and a privilege and uh, just wish you all the best with everything, bud. Thank you very much. Much My pleasure.